Dear friends in Christ, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Today God gives you His grace and peace through our risen Lord Jesus. I want to share with you today Psalm chapter 16, which is a prayer that was written by King David. It's a very fitting prayer, though, for us to make our own prayer on this joyous Easter occasion. Please stand as we hear Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We pray these are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Please be seated. Who in the world is going to roll this stone away? That is the question that those women who were on the way to the tomb that first Easter morning were asking each other. Who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? They were going there. And just imagine how they felt. They knew that Jesus was dead. They thought that he was gone forever. That journey to the grave on that first Easter morning must have been awfully long, lonely, and downright depressing. All of the talk about Jesus being the Messiah, the promised one, it seemed so distant, so cold, so dead. Their hopes, their dreams, their aspirations about Jesus, they must have been, at that point, all but shattered. Those women, they still wanted to do what was right. They wanted to bring those spices. They wanted to anoint Jesus' body. They wanted to give him a proper burial. They loved Jesus. If he couldn't live, they at least wanted him to die with honor and respect as a great teacher. Just think of that attitude and perspective of those women as they were on the way to the tomb. And really, that is a perspective, that's an attitude that really all people deal with. We battle with death, don't we? And sometimes the battle seems to be going pretty well for us in our lives. We're healthy. Our kids are all doing okay. The tax season is almost over. God is gracious, and there is indeed much to rejoice about. But then there are other times when it seems as if death and Satan are winning. Someone you love dies. There's a sickness that just won't go away. There's an accident. The economy stinks. You lose your job. Jobs are lacking. School gets tough. There's fighting at home. Divorces happen. You've experienced such times when this fight, this struggle, seems awfully long and the battle is awfully tough. In fact, for some people, it seems that the struggle, the battle, will never end. It can feel as if there's no future, no hope for things to ever get better. You know, St. Paul once wrote a letter to a group of people that were feeling awfully hopeless and lost. They wondered what was really going on, and they were near the point of despair. 
Some people in the church in the Greek city of Corinth, they weren't sure about the resurrection of the dead. They didn't know whether those who had died would ever rise again. They thought that if you lived and then you died, well then that was it. That was the end. To these people, St. Paul wrote that if we only have Christ for this life, if we only put our hope in Christ now, well then we are to be pitied more than all other men. Sometimes people become miserable, they become lost and hopeless because they don't know, they don't understand, or maybe they forget the most basic fundamental core of the Christian faith. They forget what Christianity is really all about, its whole purpose. Such people live their lives as if they assume that Jesus' dead body is still sitting in some grave outside of Jerusalem, molding away. And really, when we allow the trials and the troubles and the afflictions and struggles of our life to define us, we have that same kind of attitude. It's as if we're asking that question that those women were asking on the way to the tomb that morning. Ah, who is going to roll away this burdensome stone off of us? Out of our way. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you just go ahead and put on a happy face, that you have a positive attitude and then expect things to get better. Fact is, there are going to be times in our lives when things are hard. We're going to suffer. We are going to be in pain in this life. God tells us to expect that. But dear friends, greater than that, more important to understand than that, is the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead. And for poor, weak sinners like you and me, who have brought suffering and pain upon ourselves, that is really good news. In fact, it's the greatest news that we could ever hear. For what King David exclaims in the psalm applies to us. He said, You, O Lord, will not abandon my soul to Sheol, to the grave. Or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And dear friends, that's what Easter is really all about. God has shown us this path of life. This is the path that God wants us to walk on. The path of life that will carry us through all of the suffering and death, all the, all the pain and affliction and trouble that we face in this world. This path is Jesus Christ who said himself, I am the way, that is, I am the path, I am the truth, I am the life. And we walk this path of life when we see that Jesus' death and his resurrection are for us. We walk this path when we can pray as King David did in our psalm. You are my Lord, apart from you, I have no good. When we have this path of life, we can confess the words of the 23rd psalm. That yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Dear friends, we don't have to fear as we walk through the dark troublesome paths in this world. We don't have to be bogged down in sorrow or despair. We don't even have to ask that question, who in the world is going to roll this stone away for us? Because Christ is alive. Jesus has taken that stone and he has rolled it away from us. There is nothing that blocks our path. Jesus comes to us and he says, see what I have done for you. Follow me. Follow this path by putting your faith in me. I am your Savior from sin. See that my path leads you to life, eternal life. Now maybe there are some out there who are struggling to believe that this path is meant for them. Maybe you're asking yourself, how do I walk on this path? Maybe you're asking yourself, what if Jesus' death and resurrection isn't enough? For me, maybe you're thinking that you're not worthy of God. But dear friends, time and again in God's word, 
He tells us that this path of life is open and it is intended for everyone. No matter how great your sin, no matter how much you've screwed up, no matter how much you are tempted, no matter how much you struggle, even after you fall into temptations, even when those struggles get the best of you, God still comes to you and He offers to help you. He wants to pick you up and set you back on that path of life. Look at St. Paul, for instance. If anyone could have claimed, I'm not worthy of God's grace, I'm not worthy of God's help, it was Paul. He, with all sincerity, once claimed that he was the chief of all sinners. Out of everyone, he said, I am the worst, the least among the disciples of God. And St. Paul wasn't lying. Before he was converted, Paul was a persecutor of the church. He had blood on his hands. He was a murderer, and he delighted in it. All the while, he sought to mock Jesus. He wanted to make Jesus' followers suffer. But God intervened. God had mercy on Paul. He forgave Paul. He baptized Paul. He washed Paul clean. He took Paul's sins away. And though he was once an unbeliever, a hater of God, God made Paul his own child by showing him and putting him on that path of life that is found in Christ Jesus. God did this for Paul, and God wants to do it for you and for everyone in this world. He wants to set us on the path of eternal life. In fact, that's why he sent Jesus into our world in the first place. That's why Jesus took on human flesh and blood. That's why the eternal Son of God became also a man. That's why Jesus spent his entire life living a life of perfection according to God's law, according to God's will. That was the life that we, dear friends, should have been living, but that we failed to live. Jesus lived it for us in our place as our substitute. And it was also a holy, perfect life that was filled with great suffering, pains, troubles, and even death. Even when Jesus hung upon the cross, forsaken by God, suffering the pains of hell as we consider it on Good Friday, He was doing that for you. He did that to pay the price for your sins. But now, dear friends, Easter morning we have a reason to celebrate. Because Jesus is not dead. He is alive. He is living. And that's also meant for us. God is saying, look at Jesus. Look at this tomb. It's empty. It's open. He is not there. He is risen. He has conquered death. And so too, because of Christ, so too do you conquer death. In all of these things, Jesus was blazing a trail for us. He was making that very path of life for us to walk on by giving himself for us. He gives himself for us so that we can actually live. And not just live to suffer another day. He wants us to live in total happiness with unending joy and bliss. In fact, this is what we confessed a few moments ago when we when we confess together the words of the second article, Jesus did this that I might be his own, live under him in his kingdom, serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. Dear friends, over the past few weeks of Lent, we have discussed how desperately we need God's forgiveness. We've talked about the destruction that our own sins have brought upon our lives. But more important than that is that we've heard about God's forgiveness. We've heard how He desperately longs to forgive you. We've heard how His forgiveness covers you completely so that you might be with Him forever in eternity. And that's what we have on Easter. We have the completion of that forgiveness given to us. 
And it gives us a reason, dear friends, to rejoice and be glad. We know and understand that the things that weigh us down in this world, all the troubles and afflictions in this life are fleeting. They're going to pass. Jesus lives. He is risen from the dead. And that means that God is now at peace with you. You don't need to be afraid of anything that comes your way. Jesus is risen. And that is the most important thing that could ever matter for us. Because, dear friends, it means that we are now on the path to life. Put there by our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please rise. May the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.